To już możemy zaczynać. Witam Państwa na kolejnym panelu poświęconym. Let us begin. I welcome you at level two panel gamification. We will be speaking not only for games as fun, but we will be speaking about other uses of games, sometimes ethical, doubtful uses, perhaps, as you will see in a moment in uh, the film. We have prepared an interdisciplinary panel. We have here Simone, academic attitude to games, then Paul, a designer, and Pavel, he will be speaking about gamification of your problems, if you have any. So theoretical and practical aspects. And I'm delighted we have so many different attitudes, and I will be doing my best to focus on this interdisciplinary character of games, speaking on them from different perspectives. Before we start, let us start with a short film, our introduction on gamification. Zombies from your backyard. Life is a journey, and in this journey, we all want to do more, experience more, feel more, and live with no boundaries. And why shouldn't we? Sight System presents Sightseeing. Feel free to go anywhere. Actually, it's a, it's a sports jacket, so it's a lot less official than it looks. What do you mean? Sorry? What's the difference between a sports jacket and a normal one? Uh, I guess a sports jacket is for people who want to look good even when they're chased by the police. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I hope you're hungry. This yeah. place has the best burgers in town. Oh, actually I'm vegetarian. Oh. Yeah. Really? Because you didn't say it on your profile, so... Well, I don't write everything on my profile, so... Um, 
Do you want to go somewhere else? No, 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 it's okay. I'll find something on the menu. Well, how about a glass of wine, for starters? Yeah, great. So, are there any other things in your profile that you didn't write about that I should know, or...? <laughs> Aren't you scared of jogging by yourself in the city? Not really. Besides, I'm about to hit level five on Marathon Master. Pretty impressive. I know. <laughs> mm. What is scary though? On my last route, my sight crashed. So scary. I didn't see anything. I couldn't find my way home. Sight doesn't crash. Oh, it did. I was totally lost. I didn't see anything. That doesn't happen since our last patch. Do you work there or something? <laughs> Really? Yeah. Right. Wow. What do you do there? Nothing serious. I'm just a simple engineer. Actually, I read about your company in the news. <sighs> Is it true that you guys implant stuff and manipulate people's uh, sight? <laughs> it's just bullshit. <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to talk about work. Not when I'm here with such a pretty lady. <laughs> You know, you really get me. You know, I can tell what you're thinking right now. Really? What? Well, we finished our drinks. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> How about we go to my place for a nightcap? Well, if you're so good in reading my mind, you should know what I'm going to say. <laughs> there it is. Take your stuff out. Nice place you've got here. It's all right, I guess. A toast for a perfect night. Why are you drinking? What's that? A dating app. No, 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 no. Oh, my God. It's for I programming. It's just my luck. A friggin' gay jump. Disgusting. Wait, no, yes. wait. Do not touch me, you creep. Fed it. I said wait. Now let's try this again. Well, so I hope this has been a good introduction to our ethical, more or less serious considerations about limits or borders. Some humor at the beginning, but let us move on perhaps to our guests. I would like our guests to say a few words about themselves now, how they are involved in games. Who, who would like to start talking about uh, themselves and their games? I was hoping I would get the, the, the friend on but it doesn't, well, it doesn't do it. Okay. Yeah, but it, was, it was checked and it didn't do anything, so yeah, I just have to have to do this out. Okay, uh, hi, nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Simone Sebusto, I'm from the University of Düsseldorf, and uh, we've been doing a project since last year at the university to turn one of our courses into a game as much as possible. It's called The Legend of Zurin, and I just want to give a short uh, 
presentation on what that entails. Now, first off, uh, why did we do this? Uh, personally, I consider myself a gamer. Uh, some of my colleagues are gamers too. And uh, I know in education there's a lot of people who say uh, games are bad, and then others are say uh, games are good. And I think that's the wrong question to ask. I think the right question to ask is, what can we learn from games in order to make our courses better? Because uh, gamers are dedicated people. They spend a lot of time and effort on getting better at games, at learning strategy, at beating the game. And if we could get some of that motivation and dedication in our courses, then I think uh, we've done a lot of good. So uh, before I talk more about the project, I wanted to give a quick introduction to role-playing games, except if everyone already knows what role-playing games are. Anyone who uh, doesn't know what role-playing games are? Everyone knows? Because then, because I only have five minutes, so um, I'll just give you the quick, uh, yeah, I'll just, <laughs> you can, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that was a quick introduction to role-playing games, just to review, so we all, <laughs> so we all uh, on the same page. Okay, so uh, we took a second semester course uh, that our students have to do, and uh, that course consists of three parts. The first is a lecture where students uh, learn the subject matter. Then there's an online platform, which is sort of like the heart of our system, where people play a game. It's, uh, when I say play a game, I don't mean they walk through a virtual world. Unfortunately, like we're working on that for version 10 or something. Uh, right now it's still early days. So it's uh, basically a narrative framework with lots of role-playing elements um, where students solve quests. And uh, in the end, at the end of the quest, there's always exercises, so that's like the student's homework. And uh, there's also an accompanying lab uh, where we do further quests in real life. Okay, so how does this look? Uh, in the beginning, students get to choose a race. They can be elves, goblins, orcs, or humans. And uh, once that's done, they embark on a quest for the legendary Book of Knowledge. Uh, which has long since been thought lost uh, and was split in four parts. Um, there's main quests which the students have to follow where they have to solve the exercises in order to pass the course. And then there's optional side quests where students can have further adventures. So basically they'll encounter uh, an old lady at the side of the road and she'll be like, oh, can you help me carry my courses home? Uh, and you'll be like, nah, I'd rather not. Or uh, yes, please. Uh, why do we have uh, main quests and side quests besides making things more fun? Um, the side quests allow students to earn more XP and basically they need to reach a certain amount of experience points to pass our course. And if they uh, gain further points, they gain a bonus on their final exam uh, up to one whole mark. So people who do a lot of stuff in the game can actually get a better mark at the end of the course. Um, that's a bit what the game looks like. Um, our, yeah, your avatar levels up with you, obviously. And uh, then, as I said, there's a practical lab as well. And the important thing here is students get together in guilds. Guilds are like groups. Uh, people who play uh, MMORPGs know what guilds are, of course. But basically, the difference to normal group work is, one, uh, students have a personal identity with their group. They can choose a guild name. They can form their own guild uh, as whatever they would like. And uh, within the group, they can work together but also they compete with other guilds. And uh, what I found particularly fascinating uh, with this is students hate group work. I was the same as a student. I can totally understand that group work is always like, you have to work together, but in the end, the people who care most do all the work. And guilds are different. And you, could, you can see that as soon as students understand that it's different, they're much more excited about it. Because for one thing, you don't have to work together. It's more like you're allowed to help each other out within the group. At the same time, you're competing with other people. Um, and I guess being able to beat other people for more points makes students excited. Being able to identify with their group makes them more interested in that. And uh, I think it was, it's fascinating how you see students' mood shift from the word group work to, you know, we're doing guild quests. Uh, here are some impressions of what our guild quests look like. Uh, they, they can be something, our guild quests may be a short word on what they look like. There's stuff like uh, a Jeopardy quiz show or scavenger hunts. Uh, this is a photo from one of our scavenger hunts. Uh, yeah, so that's a short intro into our project. Thank you.
Welcome. Thank you. I, being a journalist, I often, have to, uh, I often have to present some complex topic in a very brief uh, way, so I admired personally the way you gave us the brief introduction what we're playing games. I thought that was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Now we're going to move to the next one. Ja Wisła, ja Wisła, jak mnie słyszycie, over. Amy, I will manage without any slides. I just have uh, a few things to, to say and no pictures actually attached. We were to speak about the future of gamification. This is the title of this panel. I started thinking about the, first, the past actual of gamification, what happened earlier. And when I started my work on gamification, I had quite a different understanding of what gamification is about. In the old days, I used a different definition, a mechanic definition, as I call it. Gamification is using mechanisms from games for the change of behavior of people in the real world. And I'm referring to the projects you mentioned. Some of Polish universities also tried to run similar projects, but they did not succeed. They failed. Well, projects, perhaps, they, they, they were okay, perhaps, but uh, the level of satisfaction of the students uh, when compared classes in guilds and classes in normal groups, it was exactly the same. Nothing changed in the results, for instance. Uh, the students scored at the final result. So uh, I think gamification is very much about fun. So what I'm going to talk about is adding fun to something that usually is not about fun. This is how I understand gamification now. So from this attitude of collecting points, for instance, a good score, uh, trying to achieve it, we move to psychology and, and fun. And what will happen in the future? I wanted to show to you two cases in which gamification can be used, what it uh, can end up in. And let us start with something that those attitudes have in common, Wikipedia. People very much interested in, in games, I think. This is such people are mainly responsible for most of the content in Wikipedia, in my view. Gamers are quite different from the other people, I believe. Gamers like doing things together. Gamers are convinced that uh, they will manage that somehow good solutions will be found. In 2008, Google introduced what is called Google virtual money. It comes from Ruble, Google. And those Googles, the virtual currency, what is it all about? If, if, if you work, for instance, for Google and you have some of those Googles there, you can buy some calculating power of the uh, computers, of the processors for, for your own calculations. This is one similar, one possible solution. And what is especially important, what also those Googles can be used for, is, is betting, so-called prediction markets. Google simply sometimes bets, for instance, over lunch with uh, with people whether they will manage to, to to do something, a new project, for instance, a new office in Moscow, whether Google will open it, whether the shares will go up or down. And they use it as a, as a form of fun. It's it's fun, but at the same time, lots of information, lots of knowledge can be drawn from it. So for those Googles, the first side result is that apart from fun, the workers are much more optimistic once they uh, make a bet about a posit positive outcome of a certain event, and they're more focused on simply very often working more, giving more to, to succeed. A possible psychologically interesting attitude, new motivating technique. And the second side result is just knowledge, poor knowledge, poor information. So creativity stimulated at a low level, perhaps people doing things at, at free time, sometimes a basic, sometimes stupid idea that evolves and becomes a, something very useful. And a third thing that they discovered, those Googles, uh, they had, of course, specialists, sociologists checking how uh, or what kind of opinions are there in the company, what people think about this and how opinion are shaped. And perhaps the most important thing about shaping opinions among people is physical presence together, being present or being together with others simply. It's not about the different classes that we mentioned earlier, the social groups. It's not about belonging to a social group. It's not about friendships, but common opinions. Simply people share opinions, usually the people who stay together. So Google started moving people around the company according to this type of attitude. And IBM, still another company, with gamification, they tried to solve the problem of too many 
emails on average that people were getting. You don't work, I guess, in big corporations. <laughs> Looking at you, I don't think you've got much experience with working for big corporations. But according to some information I have, it's the average of 300 emails a day for, per, for one person in the company. Some are very important. You have to prepare something. But many of those emails are very low value, like who has left pizza in the fridge, this type of email, for instance, people get. Then I go to a meeting, and if this discussion about pizza escalates, then it's full of emails about pizza, and just well, you can find there one or two more important emails. So what did IBM do? They decided to attach special additional value to outcoming messages. So if you send out an email to 300 people, you, you, there is no cost attached. If there were some cost related, you would think twice. So IBM introduced into the email system serious so-called virtual currency, serious. So at the beginning for each day, each employee gets a certain number of uh, serious currency. If you want to send the email, you have to attach uh, some of these currency as if post stamps. If you have a limited number, you will think twice before you actually send such emails to everyone. So a certain mechanism, and uh, what happened? What were the results? First of all, of course, this resulted in uh, much uh, fewer emails, fewer emails being sent. People started working together also because once you get this this currency, you can you can use it on a given way, on on the same way. And if you want to send, for instance, a contact uh, someone important in the company, people started collecting. Uh, uh, currency together, pooling as if their resources, so it's 5,000 uh, serious, so that this email, important email, can be sent to the managing director or marketing uh, uh, specialists. And then they, they know exactly that if, if there was there's so much currency attached, they know that the email is serious. They also employed some, some specialists to check actually what happens to this currency. And actually, there are some divisions in the company that send very often messages with uh, plenty of uh, serious attached. So this is something very important, saying that yes, it means yes, you have to read what is important there. And what did they do? They actually put it in one office to optimize the, the whole structure. And now if you ask me about the future of gamification, again, going back to Wikipedia, this is something unique because nobody knows everything, but everybody knows something. So the problem is to motivate people so that people actually write down what they know. So I think gamification is an excellent tool to, I think, get this knowledge from people. Very often you can find this knowledge and uh, simply get it, put it on a higher level so that it can be useful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating introduction, although as a skeptic I must notice immediately and quote the results of a certain study. I don't know where it was made precisely in the US, I think that it was called HOTO, so this is called Hawthorne Effect, a very interesting study conducted by people who were testing the optimization of a corporation and showed that every study helps to improve efficiency because when people know that they are studied they work more efficiently so they were testing whether it's better to work in a higher temperature lower temperature more light less light even if they returned to what there was before everything was the same okay I'm a skeptic I must ask such a question <clears throat> a part of my nature that's stronger than me so it's on to you now um, can we have the screen screen Let me try again. Yeah. All right, <laughs> it works. All right, thank you for having me. So here I, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the imposter, I'm the outlier, and I'm going to try to tell you exactly what I do, and hopefully it will help you to figure out why I'm so angry and why I'm so grumpy. So uh, most of my work is released under, under the project name Mall Industria, that means uh, soft industry or soft factory. It's a project about ideology and uh, electronic entertainment. And the idea is to combine the traditional agit prop, social engaged communication with a, co a deconstructionist uh, approach to video games. So on one hand, uh, this is about using games as a form of communication spreading alternative messages and so on. And on the other hand, uh, it's about messing 
with the language of mainstream games. So trying to be a sort of remedy against the idiocy of mainstream games. So uh, I have mo mainly two approaches that, that I used. Um, I think one big property of games, as we said before, is the role play uh, that sort of sets them apart from uh, story-based or narrative, linear, non-interactive uh, kind of media, uh, cultural art form. Uh, so uh, you don't just uh, identify with a character, but you get to sort of experience uh, a certain world, a certain uh, rules system uh, uh, from another perspective. And most of mainstream games, uh, use role-playing function of escapism, and they tend to be power fantasies. Uh, um, but I think it's possible to expand the scope of role-play in a different way. That's what, what is sometimes called uh, awkward role-playing. Uh, I, I like to go against this tendency uh, of like escapism to, and, and essentially make games about uh, trivial everyday life things like labor or like uh, monotony and uh, 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 routine and, and so on. This is a uh, a uh, game called Everyday the Same Dream that is about this white, anonymous white collar, sort of one dimensional man uh, going to, get, getting stuck in, in traffic and going to his cubicle and being stuck in this, uh, essentially in this uh, daily routine until uh, supposedly some players do, some players don't. You find ways to uh, subvert and to, and to uh, get out of this uh, perpetual. Uh, awkward situation. Uh, this other one is uh, also some sort of based on a, on, a, on a character going to work. This is a narrative game about a day in the life of a drone pilot. Uh, so you are this guy who operates uh, unmanned aerial vehicles in Pakistan while living a suburban normal life in Las Vegas. So it, empl it employs this split screen. I can skip a little bit ahead employs this split screen that, to me, re reflects the disconnection and the dissonance of this uh, 21st century soldier that is uh, both on the front line and both at home. So you, uh, you get some med medals, I guess that's my take on gamification. Um, um, and then you, you get back to, to your family and you're sort of talking to your, to your kid and bonding over video games and so on, and you contribute to the development of this character. It's very linear, very um, constrained in a way, but the main kind of exploration you, you, you end up doing is uh, developing the character. You can decide if the, this protagonist is uh, a jingoist, patriotic asshole, or if it's a more like a depressed, uh, uh, guilty uh, type of, of soldier. Anyway, the other... Um, Another uh, approach is very different, almost opposite, I would say, which is a more like systemic approach. So games, as we, as we, as we said before today, are uh, at their core systems, system of rules that you can uh, get to know by interacting with them. So the, the hypothesis is, due to the fact that they are inherently systemic and dynamic, maybe they can be better suited to uh, represent dynamic and uh, complex systems as opposed to linear uh, media. So maybe cer certain systems can be better represented in an interactive form. I tried to test this idea a bunch of years ago with this game called the McDonald's video game, in which you play as the CEO of this um, company, the McDonald's. And uh, you try to manage the process of your um, hamburger from uh, the pasture to the restaurant. And in doing so, you sort of have to take some uh, potentially unethical decision, decisions. You are under pressure because your board of directors wants, obviously, to maximize profit. And that sort of forces you to do things like uh, uh, maybe adding animal flour and uh, um, more like poisonous and unhealthy things, or abuse your workers and uh, devise uh, unfair marketing strategies and so on. So it looks like an, adverti an advertising game, but it's actually a critique of that industry. It's a systemic critique, right? Um, this other one, uh, this other one is a recent one. It's also related to um, a production process, but in this case, the, um, it's a more abstract than a, uh, process. I believe you can attempt to represent even abstract systems. It's not about a thing. It's about, if you, if you will, it's about industrial capitalism and uh, it's the uh, uh, late uh, uh, post for this evolution. It's about the 
uh, tension between uh, technological innovation and labor. So you're uh, confronted with certain choices, such as uh, 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 invest in research to get new uh, to get new products, or invest in uh, automation to essentially. Uh, get rid of some workers that at some point might might become disaffected or or angry. Um, so um, to conclude, like as you probably in, as you probably got at this point, like I see uh, an approach games as representational forms, uh, which is uh, in a way is transversal to the de to the debate regarding all oh, games as processes or games as. Uh, uh, like formalist versus non-formalist. I, I tend to focus on uh, rule systems and objects, but uh, I think uh, I think this is actually orthogonal to uh, what uh, some panelists were were talking about before. I think games can be object we can think with, like moving images, like uh, music and, te and tests. They can be interfaces be between people. Uh, they can be conversation that can happen via body language or VR verbal language uh, uh, with conflicting desires and through computation and storytelling. This is quite the opposite of gamification, which sees games or, I would say, some very specific game elements as tools to change behavior, to convince people to essentially to consume more, to work more, uh, or work for free, and to essentially quantify and uh, extract value from uh, human relationship. That's what we saw in the first uh, uh, kind of dystopic, dystopian uh, uh, short. Like, the, to me, one of the main un ideologically, uh, ideological underpinning of gamification is that, yes, you can uh, effectively quantify, put a number on a certain uh, uh, social and still unquantified function of human life, like relationship, like dating, like uh, motivation, desire, and so on. That's it. So. Thank Thank you very much. I'm glad you're here, and because if you're an imposter, then I'm here as a saboteur because uh, I'm skeptical about gamification, skeptical about, about industry. You're so. even then. Ale, więc, ale już tak troszeczkę bardziej serio przechodzić. A bit on a more serious note, I'd like to return to the film that we started, even with the greatest enthusiast of gamification, I believe that even in my colleague on my right hand side, something that we see in this film, we see a border beyond which this is something that happens into horror. Where is that border? Wait. Was it to the end? No. To me, this was more or less when the guy left home. As long as he was having fun, that's all right. But as soon as he starts manipulate another person who doesn't know that this application is used against her, well, there was this. That, that was the instinctive moment when the informed consent principle was broken. And see, people are immediately doing. No, come on. Wojtek is here so that we oppose what he's saying. Simple. The same form of manipulation are the psychological tricks that people learn at universities, often used in corporations by manipulating the human gestures manner of behavior. That's what we're learning at psychology classes. May I? May I? Yep. Let me say so. Gamification in this film was poor. It was poor in the sense that he had that wingman application. Okay, this date is what gets on your nerves. He had that wingman on him and for getting him, uh, getting a girl Why? gave him points. That's the poor part. The good part is the informing one. It says the statistics that tells you 78% will be easier once you've given them a glass of wine. There's nothing about gamification here. Have you ever phoned someone before going to meet someone? No, I've got to convince him about something. What does he like? This is precisely what this machine did. But you got it from another person. We got it from an automated system. Speaking about gamification, one of my favorite uh, 
implication is Foursquare. When I use Foursquare, I feel like James Bond, something that I really, really uh, wanted to have that I didn't have. Come on. Girls are not important. He was dropped somewhere over southern Tajikistan in a tank to make his life even more difficult. And he lands there. He's there. He comes out from this uh, bomb uh, hole and he says, Southern Tajikistan, I know a great cafe around here. And that's something that I really wanted to have. He must have had that ear where lots of people were giving him information or what. Now, I have four square and I can do it. I can say Krakow. I know a perfect place to party around here. But it's got nothing to do with ethics. Okay, let's uh, now ask our guests. Uh, really count on Paolo Lass word. So, you didn't see any ethical problems in this film either, or did you see any? I just think precisely like my colleague, we must tell the difference. It was a very interesting film, but it makes two realms. On the one hand, gamification. On the other hand, manipulation with people uh, through information. So, this was manipulated because at the same time, in this application, he would learn certain things. This has got nothing to do with gamification. You could do it without gamification either. That was a kind of big brother of this transparent person. This was not in your profile, so we disclose everything in the profile. You can uh, read about everything, but to me this is not pure gamification. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, you should. You should. Uh, um, should come over Pittsburgh and try Foursquare there. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, yeah. Uh, it's true that it's true that the video mixes two elements, but to me they are essentially the same. The same thing. To me are. Um, uh, I, I'm glad that somebody. Some. I think Matthias mentioned the gamification is bullshit statement by uh, Ian Bogost. Uh, because uh, it's interesting, like that, the, the the debate for a while was: uh, uh, is gamification going to work? Is it a thing? Is it like a normal, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting points for lo loyalty cards and things like that? And to me, that that is not too that interesting because I'm not that invested in uh, making uh, uh, schools more efficient uh, even though I'm a, I'm a teacher <laughs> but I don't believe in efficiency in learning and I don't believe in uh, efficiency in uh, uh, in corporations because uh, that usually means uh, kind of like ramping up the exploitation factor um, so uh, to me, the issue is not gamification is real or not, and how it relates with other like Web 2.0 and so. But to me, it, it's in interesting and important to discuss because it represents a, a fantasy, a fantasy of uh, of late capitalism. Like uh, it's, it's, that's what companies want, and therefore it's interesting to me. And and what they want is essentially. Um, try to impose, impose themselves, I'm talking about certain specific companies like Google, especially with Google Glass, what is Google Glass, which uh, that the video is essentially referencing, is uh, this intention and uh, again, again fantasy of um, imposing uh, yourself, uh, it's like a corporation, uh, as an intermediary, as a sort of like interface uh, between all the experiences. So between you and the world outside, you always have this uh, kind of corporate control interface, which is something that we have every time that we essentially open a computer, we do a Google search. But that's not enough, right? There is opportunity for expansion. Like when I'm walking around without, you know, kind of like without a clear uh, goal or clear destination, uh, I still don't have this uh, kind of corporate framing and uh, what they want is to conquer essentially this thing. When I have a conversation and I ask people, hey, like, I've never been to Krakow, okay, can you tell me like, what, what are the best, the best places here, the, the, fun, the fun pubs and so on, uh, when I have that, Google is not, doesn't have a voice or like four squares, the Silicon Valley, <laughs> California doesn't have a voice in this conversation and, and that's really annoying for them to not be part of that conversation and that's why they have Foursquare, right? So 
to me, it's interesting because of that and uh, problematic also because of that. So, <clears throat> okay, the last word that was uttered here is really something that makes me enjoy it a lot. And I think that the problem is really very well pos posed by Paolo is that all those gamification interfaces uh, afford a certain artificial outlook at the world which I really try to reject in my real life. Just like in this situation where I would be looking for a pub in Krakow, it's an artificial problem because the whole difference is that in Krakow it's easy to find and in Tajikistan you just can't find it or in Duisburg from the example that we got. But I still prefer the traditional methods, ask the friends in a corporation if we want to get to somebody. I'd rather use the traditional methods of approaching to ask someone who knows someone. I always prefer a relationship between human and human than human and interface, human with points. Aren't you scared that at the end with this four square, you really don't change a kniper for yourself, you let some corporate thing decide where you're going to take your lunch, uh, sorry, dinner, and it's a very important decision. If it were an important decision like who am I to wed, I would probably think, okay, so you know defining your borders. We all do, we all have our borders. But the first thing here is that this is only an interface, it's not as much as an interface. Where do you think the information gets into Foursquare about the knipers, about the restaurants and pubs? My friends, I can call them. I can be uh, getting on the nerves, asking them thousands of questions, or then uh, look at what they decided to make available to everyone. I'm not really keen on those interfaces. Uh, today, the interface is like that. Tomorrow, it's going to change. Now, once this relieves me from my friends, I would be really thinking about it. Now, if I get more friends thanks to it, now, your friends have been to this, this, this and that pub, and this influences my decision. If I meet more people thanks to this, no, I can't see any threats in it. Okay, and in this uh, example with students and their work, they didn't want to work in groups, but they work in guilds. Okay, now, as I said, I'm a skeptic and I will be sabotaging you. I would like to be breaking this uh, progress. I like the vision of the university, quite medieval, and I believe it must be... No, no, that's not a university. No, no, that's not a university. I like the fact that the university managed to... Uh, defend its autonomy against communism and I'm very much afraid that it's going to lose it to capitalism which wants to make it more efficient and it should I believe keep this uh, uh, traditional instance master and uh, disciple and I'm afraid that things may kill this relationship <laughs> Well, let's assume it's not about efficiency, that we did it of pure passion. We want plenty of joy and we also have feedback. You learn more? Great, but this is not about efficiency. It's not just learn, learn and learn. No, that was mostly all about doing things more interesting, interesting for the student to motivate them to have something positive from it and not only work on what is an output from the point of view of a company. That was the assumption. Um, I just kind of have a critical question also about the gamification. Don't you think that uh, to give them like uh, this competitivity or points or scores or something that is uh, good or, or bad, uh, just remove the motivation from the thing that they are doing and put it externalized? Uh, nein, glaube ich nicht. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Um, vielleicht kann man sagen, ich bin zur Gamification gekommen. I'm not a game designer, but I experience gamification and I believe that it can have positive impact. 
I don't think that in any way it destroys the internal motivation. You cannot build motivation with gamification where it never existed, but you can improve it, you can bring it up. This is also about the joy. Gamification is defined as something. We take it and we combine it with certain experience. That's not gamification. It would be too easy. There is the question, this is the question whether criticism starts. Gamification to me is something that changes, turns something into a game and not just lets us award points for things. I will be now pestering you and badgering with questions of a skeptic. I always try to think that an institution that tries to get me into gamification, we're not all here for pleasure. My corporation could play with me. No, I'm coming here because this is my work and I would feel very suspicious. I'll be the one who will always try to break the system saying that we are having fun here. No, we are working. That's not the reason why we're going to school. Don't you have this skepticism in your outlook? Won't the students say, hey, did we come to play here or to learn? Nobody's going to say so. Well, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. That was uh, a question that we asked. That was absolutely voluntary thing. Now we're doing it for another year. And all the students said that they would like to, but this was a voluntary approach. We had normal courses without gamification if they wanted. We don't force anyone into play. So we have here this informed consent. Yeah. Uh Try to go. Well, um, uh, I'll try to divert a little bit from the more like, um, I guess, essentialist idea like modernity versus uh, old, old school uh, kind of education and uh, talk a, bit, uh, a little bit more in, in specific. I think I do actually believe that play can be employed in uh, teaching and education. Uh, and in fact, I actually do a, a little bit of that, um, mostly because, uh, um, yeah, I, real, I recognize that people who grew up with, in a digital age, the digital natives, the millennials, uh, are, have a different kind of, a, are, are differently prone to engagement. I just, just realized that as, as soon as I show uh, just like a video that is longer than 15 minutes, they start to to fall asleep, and uh, my students are really good, are elite students. So there is a little bit of a problem, and we have to sort of tactically engage as teachers with it. Uh, but um, regarding the, the kind of gamification we are discussing, I think uh, one of the most common fallacies uh, is that gamification is often proposed and promoted by people who are not that invested into games. They are not really game designers or they have a, a kind of like a very uh, superficial and a little bit old time, timey idea of games. The games are about points, about uh, uh, kind of like um, getting into some kind of high score. And that's, uh, and that's to me an issue because uh, uh, first it sort of flattens the, the scope of what games can be. And also it doesn't do a good service to play and to education in general to just, because uh, we already have uh, numeric uh, indicators, we have uh, tests, we have grades, and so you don't really need to create another layer of uh, XP, like experience points and so on. By the way, if you want to see what that kind of uh, idea and ideology is producing in, uh, in the North American schools, so you, you, can, you can read a lot. Now a lot of um, uh, parents and families are rejecting the idea of testing, the idea of computing and uh, standardizing uh, evaluations because what happens is that if you have high stake uh, evaluation, if you have a quantification, obsessive quantification that is actually affecting the policies and, uh, and so on, you have the school essentially become training camps for that kind of test. So that's, that's a bit of, a, of an issue. But I see other issues that are, um, uh, like the, the other issue is, for example, not all gamers are really invested into uh, 
leveling up, uh, looting, uh, and so on. Not even role-playing game gamers. Actually, there is a model, and there are some uh, RPG uh, experts here in the audience that can talk about uh, the different kinds of role players. Some role players are kind of power gamers, and they play to win and to level up. And some others are more interested in the narrative aspect, and some others are more interested in, in the immersion. And uh, you, uh, Role-playing uh, role games designers are actually taking into account these different kinds of engagement. And the other, the other issue that I, I can see is the uh, narrative issues, that the idea that, um, uh, oh well, the, this language of quest, of fantasy, uh, is uh, somewhat universal. Um, and, uh, and it's not detrimental. Like, for example, I definitely know quite a lot of people that will be instantly turned off by uh, that kind of setting. Some people are more into cyberpunk, right? <laughs> so how do you, <laughs> how do you uh, create a narrative that some other people might be inter in more interested in into actual history? So how do you engage uh, narratively and uh, in an immers immersive kind of way? So there is that. And uh, um, for, as, a, as a reference, as a footnote, uh, I will encourage you to look into the Institute of Play that is, I think, founded by your colleague, right, Katie Salen? Uh, that are using, uh, uh, have been using uh, games and, uh, in education and a lot of role playing uh, way before the gamification fad started. And uh, it's, it's actually interesting they have a very multi layered approach for, as far as I understand. We ask for voices from the floor. I just wanted to uh, mention, I'm very glad that Pablo mentioned it. Pablo's got no headset. Well, I'm a gamer myself. I just like playing. There's one point where I am really... I, I really detest this uh, question. Well, as a gamer, some gamers like to lose. If we buy a game and in the, uh, the first go we reach the end, we kill all the bosses. We usually feel, I uh, believe, that every gamer uh, believes that we had cheated, the game was too easy, we lost several euro. The victory of a gamer is the loss of a consumer. If I win too early as a gamer, I feel cheated, just like a consumer who feels that his pocket has been really picked, the price of the game. Even if a corporation gets me into a gamification experience, that would end well, because I'd like to see what happens if I go the way where everything just crumbles cookie-wise. Well, uh, that's a general comment, but that's my approach to it as a game. Okay? A voice from the floor. That's actually like, I'm just wondering, gamification, uh, in other words, using games for another purpose, not just to get some satisfaction, but to learn perhaps something to make it useful. Maybe it's going back to the very source of where games come from. Lacrosse, for instance, the American game, the original American's game, simulation of, of battle, of the knights tournaments, for instance, in castles, or even schools today that are systems with their logics, uh, their principles of when you win or lose. It's not exactly life, but I think we are going back to the very source, the very beginning. And yet another issue, I understand gamification is about uh, introducing some fun into some other activities. I myself a scout, I am a scout and well already 100 years ago Baden Powell had this idea to introduce some fun and this is what we certainly use every day working with young people. There are good things about it of course, but there is a threat also game is uh, something different from life. There are other principles and people might start using uh, the principles of the system of the game and not the rules of uh, life. In the 18th century in Japan when first training equipment was used so that uh, the knives, the sharp knives are not, or swords are not used, then someone was saying that another calculation, another type of calculation would be introduced. People will start thinking that I can make an error because I will not be killed straight away because in training not real swords are being used. So my question here is about gamification. To what extent can we actually succeed? What can we do and what are the limits? Because it's always a simulation with slightly different rules. Yes, Pavel, perhaps these are the, the real problems I guess you come across as a marketing consultant. There are some plays you have, just like I myself, I will explore the system, check the different options, that's what I do, and I myself, I am a gamer. 
usually, well, I have hardly ever time for real RPG games, but with computer games, uh, I explore different options. I want to see the whole map. It's more interesting for me than uh, just going level up or uh, trying to do munchkinning, whatever it's called, collecting, obsessive collecting of points. Just like in shooting games, so once I kill all the monsters, uh, then uh, I am very happy that that's it, and I can perhaps explore the different options, the different places, to to see something more interesting. So, do you also come across such people, such problems when people uh, do not achieve, try to achieve realistic uh, aims, but they just want to do something else, collect points, which doesn't really matter? Well, you're a proper, a typical explorer, I would say. You explore in games. According to Balta, the, there are four main types of players, gamers, uh, the achievers, the explorers, the socializers, and the killers, the four main categories. And there are differences to motivations, what they actually like in games. So the problem with here gamification is that it's done only for those achievers. The, the, this is the greatest number, the achievers. Just, uh, but there are others, as, as you said. And if there is nothing attractive there in the game that has been prepared, well, they will not play or they will damage it, saying that it's not for for us. But we would manage somehow. If your corporation wants to give us some work, explore options, we will manage certainly. But going back to the question. You asked what are we able to, to gamify and to compare it to life. In life, the problem is that there are no rules very often. If there are any rules, very little even, we can do some gamification. But life as a whole, no, it's too complex in my view. Let us remember about yet another issue. Games, according to one of the definitions, game is something voluntary, as you said. Those students uh, are volunteers, they say yes, they agree. So game is something voluntary that is separated from the real world. The separation is very often a mental state. Even if I play chess, chess in a certain mental way, I draw the difference. Uh, there is a border between the chess and the surrounding world. This can be a physical place, like the football pitch where you play football, there is a line, you cross the line and you start playing football, but this can be mental also, when you are, for instance, in a traffic jam and uh, start racing, for instance, with someone standing in the line next to you, in the lane next to you, he doesn't even know there is a game there, but we sometimes do it, accelerating, checking who's faster, so certainly life is never 100% a game, there is usually a voluntary decision. We enter the game and we leave it. Once we do not see this border, then the matter for, the metaphor of life, I think, will, of game will no longer be, I think, present in our life. So we need what is the real, real world and what is outside the real world. I wonder this issue of different types of games and the achievers, explorers and so on, how does it work among students in your case at the university? Do you also see those categories, different categories of gamers? Do you see difference in which, in the way, what they achieve? Who is better, a better student or less? Do they focus on different issues? What do they consider especially important? Um, yeah, of course, there are different types. We try to also different types. Yes, of course, there are different types here as well. We try to address different types of gamers. In gamification, I'm not saying that we are focusing on achievers only. We want to also reach other categories, other types of gamers. I said in my introduction that in our game there is some narration as well. There are some elements for explorers in the course that we organize. We try to integrate them. This, of course, what we are doing is still an experiment. Sometimes we make errors, but we do our best. We explore different options and improve things when something is not right. I just want to say that uh, the achiever, um, the achiever type of gamer, is not necessarily the one that is more engaged with the process of learning or uh, optimizing or whatever, whatever is the goal of the gamification effort. But it's more likely to be the one that tries act actively to cheat the system to kind of maximize the point accumulation, regardless of what these points stand for. So that's uh, that's uh, an, an issue that everybody who designs multiplayer games, especially massively multiplayer games, that always encounter. How do you deal with those ones that are so into your game that are actually breaking it?
Nie. Chciałem wszystkich naszych panelistów zapytać o to, czy... czy, czy, czy... I have a general question to all the panelists. The ideas on gamification, do you try to use them in your everyday life? That's what I'm wondering. I myself, because of my explorer's nature, sometimes I tried, but uh, it always ended badly. Well, sometimes in, in books about how to be a better motivated, how to achieve success, uh, I read that you have to think about a certain award you can give yourself once you achieve something, but it doesn't work with me. Real life principles, there are some, and I really consider them most important. For instance, if I don't get a given number of points, my bank will say game over sooner or later and my credit card will no longer be uh, useful for me or if I look at the menu in the restaurant I will also check for instance what it means for my cholesterol level if I eat this or that so uh, usually I eat something healthier unfortunately so in my case the, the only principles are those hard principles of everyday life that I shouldn't behave too aggressively in the traffic jam that I, I might crash into someone uh, sooner or later or pay uh, fine but so in my case well I, I use the principles those hard principles of everyday life but concretely do you use somehow gamification useful like the man who's cutting the cucumber remember in the film uh, do you do something like this oh yes I do it, it can help I wouldn't try to sell with my clients anything that I have not tested with myself. If it didn't work with me, I, I would fear it would not work with others. To give you examples, in my company we had a nice game. It was about getting new assignments. 100 emails, this was the, the game. Easy principles, similar to the finger games. It was about, you have to, this is the only actual rule, you have to send 10 emails per day and the first person who will get a new assignment, a new contract from someone you have sent an email to is the winner. That's it. So this is for, for people who, who need simply new contracts, new clients. So they have to simply prepare those emails, they have to think about where to send their emails, what to write there, whether it makes sense at all. They do it and then we try to, well, make it turn into a game with an award. It's much nicer if you have clear card rules who the winner is. And then what is the prize? Well, it was, because we, we used to do it, we don't do it anymore, but we played it some time ago, it doesn't matter why. Well, well, that might be interesting why you don't play it any longer. Well, I just don't want to... Uh, I just want to change it. We have so much work that we don't need, need we don't need new contracts. We simply have enough contracts, we don't need new clients. That's why we don't play it. You forced me to say it. But the award was the, the crown, simply the crown of the lab, we called it. I don't know why it was a lab, but a crown from Burger King. And it's not that you have to wear this crown, of course. This would have no sense, but this was a special privilege. On Friday, when we ordered pizza for the company, the person who had this crown decided what kind of pizza we order on Friday. There's a certain conflict you might not be aware of, because there are two fractions in my, in my company. The, those who eat meat and vegetarians. So if the crown goes to the hands of uh, those who eat meat, they would have a delegation of uh, vegeta vegetarians asking maybe for more vegetables if the crown is in the hands of the vegetarian those men eating fraction meat eating fraction would go there and ask for some bacon for instance on the pizza so this makes our job simply more interesting this is the same thing we are doing but I think it's really nice and more fun for everyone microphone please I'm not sure it's a very important question, but does everyone like uh, working like this? Because I understand there might be some people who, who would hate playing uh, in this way. They, they might uh, not like this type of uh, thing. No, it's voluntary again. Not everyone has to do that. You can be part of the game, but you don't have to. If you don't, pl don't play, you don't lose anything, but you will never have the crown. You will never have this privilege of deciding what kind of pizza we order. That's it. You just have the crown, nothing more. So there are people who, who are part of the game, there are others who don't want to play. It was done, as I said, some time ago. Not only the customer services people could, could play, anyone was able to play that. But of course, those customer services people, they had the biggest chance. 
So you said there are so many situations in life when you have to do some calculations. So you have to calculate the, the money you have or the calories you eat. Or there are different principles like uh, traffic regulations. Uh, if you, there are violations, there are serious consequences, of course. But the difference, in my view, is that we collect the points for fun, for pleasure. There are no bad consequences there, as it has been said in the discussion. It's different when you collect points where nothing really matters, nothing really cares. It's different with your local currency, for instance. One day you will run out of, your, of money, and that's bad. If I don't have any more points, for instance, some social services, it doesn't really matter realistically. It doesn't really matter if the virtual points run out. I have a question, if I may, with regard to the ethical issues that were raised. In gamification, I understand some fun element has to be there. There are some bureaucrats that they focus on digits, numbers, and okay, let them have their fun with digits. But the NSA, for instance, we got some information that uh, NSA, the analysts who were analyzing different signals, they also use some achievement points. So people who, who decide about, for instance, uh, who who will be attacked with a drone, for instance, I think the decision should be taken by uh, real specialists, and I'm not sure the fun element should be should be there. The same goes for persecutors' office. Perhaps it depends who is using those points and who is trying to use gamification. I'd like to try to refer directly to the question asked by my neighbor. There are some costs. I think there are always some costs. You could ask the following question. There are companies employing people. They might say, we don't really need gamification. There is something better than points. Simply money, cash. We pay people for 10 mails that are sent, for instance. We pay people for the first customer that will um, uh, conclude a contract with us. People, why don't they, companies do it? Don't they understand that? I think they don't, but there are costs. So they know that there are certain costs, whether you speak about points or cash or pizza. You have to remember about costs. If you try to encourage workers, uh, the, the workers will try to do according to, to the encouragement, whether it's points or cash. But it's not that easy, I think. The time, for instance, it takes to write 10 emails or then get one point, perhaps the time can be used better to improve, for instance, the quality of the product. Or the time can be used better, I think, for dealing with some computer problems, uh, server problems, for instance, uh, that uh, don't work properly. So I think here you need to consider other elements as well. What is also part of gamification, if we know what the optimum motivation is, usually we, we don't have full information what the optimum encouragement, optimum system is. It's like with teachers, for instance, the, the teachers usually are paid the same amount on similar positions. It's not about points that some get more, some get fewer points. Very often we don't know exactly what the needs are, for instance, at school of all the individual children. So very much depends on the end users who's going to, to use the points, how they are going to act ethically or not. But what is more important, what can we do so that those who design games know how to create optimum motivation? <laughs> Foreign words, 
There, is, there are different programs, software, which help you learn vocabulary. And I remember someone wrote a plugin for the program I was using. You could, for instance, collect points. The more points you had, you could, for instance, get Japan, a country, and then build some constructions there. So no motivation, simply. So I was sitting down, learning new words, repeating the words I learned, and then you get close to getting Tokyo Tower, and you can learn 30 new words to, to, to get Tokyo Tower. So I learn new words because I have this additional motivation. It's just a game, but it, it has uh, clear results. So if we use gamification for our purposes, I think it's, it's not really a, a problem. As for the ethical issues, the issues you mentioned, if we use gamification for, for others when you prepare it, then certainly different ethical problems will crop up. For myself, in different contexts, I see that gamification does work. Things that I didn't find interesting make fun. I can recommend it to anyone. Yeah, I wish I could uh, come out of the closet and be like, yes, I use gamification too. <laughs> Like in my sex life. No. Uh, for that, you know. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but no, no. I, w I was thinking. I've been thinking intensely for ten minutes, and no, uh, I, <laughs> that definitely doesn't happen. I have rule. I mean, I structure myself in some way, but I will hardly call it gamification. Like I don't smoke in the morning, you know, things like that. I don't get. I don't drink more than two coffees uh, a day, or something like that, or after five. But that's that's. No gamification. I think there is a, a tendency in the gamification industry, those charlatans, uh, to sort of apply this term uh, retroactively to other things, like Foursquare. I don't think Foursquare people were actually thinking in terms of games. They were thinking in terms of, yeah, maybe an incentive, but essentially probably they were just thinking about Web 2.0, really, that kind of user-generated feedback and so on. And then they maybe added some badges to for color. But yeah. but. I think the question is interesting, and uh, I would like to ask people here in the room, like how many people are involved in an actual structured uh, uh, gamification system here? Is your hand? Yeah. Which is, in that's kind of what I expected, actually. Uh, <laughs> which to me brings me to the uh, big question of the panel, like the future of gamification. Because to me, we can also talk about the, I mean, there's no future, I mean, there's only future of gamification because there's no present, really. It's like, <laughs> It's like a virtual reality. Like, what is the future, future of, of virtual reality? Like, I don't know. We've been talking about the, the virtual reality for like 20 years, and uh, there's only kind of like an eternal, foggy, misty present, and, uh, <laughs> and that's not really happening. So it's, of, of, of course it's happening in the sense that companies are implementing those things, and it will take a while to realize that either it's bullshit or even like, or it works uh, in the same way that points and uh, other kind of rewards work. But yeah, so to me that's, that raises the question. I mean, jeszcze raz dziękuję. Mam nadzieję, że mamy chwilę na to, żeby Paweł odpowiedział. Thank you very much. Perhaps we still have a few minutes. Maybe Paweł, there was an interesting question. Why the companies that try to motivate people to send out emails, for instance, instead of uh, the stupid Burger, crown, uh, Burger King crown, why don't they give some, something else? I'm not sure whether you had similar experiences, but when you when someone speaks to me, someone might ask me, can you write something for me? I say, no, I have no time to write a new article. And then someone will say, well, but we will pay you well. And then it's different. For me, it works very well. So simply you get more money. Is it only me or cannot people be paid? Why do they get those stupid crowds? I think it works for everyone. But if something can be done in the same way or perhaps adequately enough and everything you give those people is the Burger, crown, Burger King crown, why should we pay you additional? Why should we pay you 100 zloty additional if you are happy to do it getting Burger King crown? This is not the problem of rivalry, I think. It works for many. In photography, for instance, many people complain that there are people who work for free. It's like prepare something for your portfolio, make, take some pictures, okay?
A czekaj, teraz powiedziałem coś dobrego czy złego? Say something good or something bad? Ja się rozkręcam. Well, I'm just beginning. So people keep complaining, saying that people will take pictures for free for their portfolio. And then those on the purchasing side, why do they want to get people who will do something just for, for nothing or for a portfolio or for a uh, sandwich or whatever? Because the pictures are simply good enough for them. If I get something that is good enough for me, I'm not saying it's something objectively good, but if something is good enough for me, why should I pay you 100 zloty? This is clear economy, I think, a clear business attitude. That's where gamification comes from. So leaving from, from ethics, whether you have to pay people or not, or differently. It's, it's, it's not leaving ethical things aside, but there is nothing that has to be work, and there is nothing that has to be game. That's what I say. It's like Tom Sawyer. I'm sure you've read Tom Sawyer. You, you remember his auntie told him to paint uh, the fence and he actually asks his friends to do that and they pay him for the privilege of painting his fence. So if, if someone is happy to play a game, there is no reason I should pay him for this. Is it an answer to your question? You were the first. Uh, I, I work in a games company. And one of the things we do at work is the most gamified work in the world. We play our own games. And the, the hard part is that we all hate it most of the time. And it's often very hard to motivate our people to play the games. Because, because much of the game entertainment, or even most of it, comes from some novelty. We, we like to play games that we don't know completely yet. We, don't, we like to play the games where we don't have all the badges yet. We like to earn things that we haven't earned yet. So my question to the panel is that if, if we imagine for a moment that there was a current for, for, for gamification and thus there was a future to the gamification as well, how would the gamification movement solve this novelty issue? Like, after five years, we all have all the badges and all the corporate games have been played, and all the students are, okay, again, some stupid learning game LARP thing. <laughs> so, 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 yes, I'll, I'll just hand this over to the panel. Ja, ich denke, man kann einfach neue Spiele entwickeln. Das ist doch eigentlich... Well, yes. That's a good point. So I think this innovation, this novelty certainly has to be there, just like in all the different ideas. Gamification should not be stagnant, should not stand in place, it has to be changing all the time. I agree. Well, uh, I, I worked in marketing for several years and uh, I will probably be still working in marketing, guerrilla marketing, online marketing stuff, or even like big brands we were working for, MTV and stuff. and. Uh, um, what I simply realize is that uh, in order to, um, like there is a, not a second order kind of marketing. Before uh, selling stuff to consumers, you have to sell techniques uh, and uh, uh, strategies to uh, producers, right? And that's, that's the role of the marketing, especially if you're not in-house marketing person. That's the role of the consultant. That's kind of what I, what I was doing as well. And uh, this, this fed, these fads generally don't last that long. They have a very quick hype cycle, and then they sometimes they get sta sta stabilized and they get implemented in normal normal policies. So uh, that is not a pro is not going to be a problem for uh, gamification people because when the novelty wears out, they will be on the next big bullshit. So it will be like on a, like I remember like when I started, there was like blogs, uh, like everybody should had a should should have a blog, and then there was Facebook, and then there were were, were viral videos, right? But now no company is really like investing too much in, in viral videos anymore. We, I mean, there are some that manage to do that, or like advert games. Obviously, like that's that's what I was doing. Advert games lasted a couple of years, and then and they were like, all right, I guess people don't like our <laughs> terrible games. <laughs> so like that's not a problem for like the market marketers, right? Because they were, we will be forgetting about gamification in uh, I would say like two years. <laughs> To jeszcze mamy pytanie z końca sali. Ja mam pytanie dotyczące grywalizacji w szkole. The question about uh, gamification in universities. Someone said there have been some attempts in Poland, but uh, you said uh, the, the experiences were negative. They didn't really succeed. Can you give us some examples, concrete examples, names? 
not not names, not not teachers perhaps, but institutions, universities. Can you give us some examples of Polish universities where gamification was introduced? Where exactly some good and bad examples are at other universities in Europe? This is also my question to our experts here. Uh, as for other panelists, do you know examples of interesting cases, gamification from un European universities? Good examples, but failures as well. I would be very much interested. I'm not going to give you concrete names because, well, that, that's, that's clear. Uh, let's say a university from southern Poland is all I can say. But which one? Okay, tell us. It doesn't really matter which one. They showed me a report and they, they showed the different problems. It's not about. Uh, showing that they did badly, but it's not that they didn't succeed. They perhaps were not prepared. They didn't know what would happen. It's something new. They were experimenting. And then if, if now publicly, if we say they did some gamification as first uh, university in Poland and it was a total failure, I don't want to give names. So I cannot give you concrete names. But I've seen some reports, some comparisons, comparison of the group with gamification control group. And as for the differences in achievements, there was no, no difference difference in fun they had during the whole process, no difference in the end results between the gamification group and the control group, no difference even in the fun. But it has been done somewhere. At Apollo University, we had a great project. What? What happened? What? Are you saying that this was a, an, you give us a name of Poly University because this was your project? No, no, I'm just saying it because uh, this was a, a good case and I don't want to quote names of those who didn't succeed. And it was not my project, they did it on their own. What was the idea? It was about motivating students to write better essays. And still referring to the discussion we had whether we pay, uh, and what we pay for, whether in the, you mentioned the NSA and persecutors. No, gamification cannot motivate people to do complicated things, to take complicated moral decisions, for instance. No, uh, gamification is in, uh, cannot solve problems there. <laughs> right, I myself perhaps able to to force you to press a button more often, for instance, so very primitive actions with gamification, but as for complicated moral positions, no, certainly not, no change can occur here. So the Apollo University wanted to motivate students to write better essays, going back to the example. Because from the academic point of view, the problem was that the students would hand in their essays, and very often there are some primitive, stupid mistakes there in the essays that can be easily eliminated. Sometimes so someone wrote an essay and didn't prove it later, didn't correct some basic spelling errors, for instance. So let's imagine uh, doing a quest, understood broadly, focus on an essay where you have to go to a library, use a dictionary, and really people handed in much better essays. They actually read it, they read their essays at least once after writing them. So this is something I can change. But to make people, I don't know, writing uh, better quality thoughts? No, no, this is impossible. There's this loaded gun that I see, which means that I'm afraid that our time is up or nearly up and now in a moment we'll have this last word using this opportunity to share this last word well there is a secret maybe that German uh, students wanted to work in guilds not in groups so probably it would be good for Polish students to combine them into political parties that would be better than guilds that's my really uh, cheesy joke for the end. I don't know how you. I learned a lot from the dear members of this panel, certainly. Thank you very much. And now everyone's invited to the first floor. There's buffet lunch. Everyone's invited. And we will continue with the next panel, the next panel at 2.30.